compelling message melds what you say about your subject and what your audience needs to know about it. In professional training, it's called gap analysis. Find out what people know, what they don't know, and your job is to fill in the gap. You do the same thing at your briefings and your updates, any of your agency council meetings. That's what you do. So you start off by having this happy sun. It's called mind mapping or webbing. In the middle of this, you would put a word or a concept that is going to be the focus of your presentation, whatever that it might be. If it's health, if it's children, whatever that it would be. Then, and psychologists have told me the brilliance behind this, start in the upper right hand corner and you start writing a word on the line and then, right on the line, and then you rotate your piece of paper the paper will turn to the left as you are writing to the right. So you're just spinning it around. This is how your bright brain works. So the creativity. You would not start off using a, one of the yellow pads of paper that has the lines. How many of us have used that? It's the fastest way to brain freeze. Because our left brain kicks in. It's like, oh, must be logical. Must put things in order. Input, input, need input. No. Instead, slide over to the right brain where the creativity is. And you can do like what Albert Einstein did, is to find food to crunch on. So celery, popcorn, pretzels, because it releases the happy hormones inside of the body. <laughs> Chocolate works for me, too. It helps, though, <laughs> because then you can have more mental clarity in what it is that you're doing. Then you write down all of your free-flowing thoughts. Now, again, Smart Draw software does this. They have complete mind mapping and turns it into your slide presentation. It's brilliant. The U.S. Navy uses this, and that's how I found out about it, doing programs for the Navy. One of my other colleagues, Thomas Leach, says, capture the essence of the talk in one complete statement. Again, what is that compelling message that needs to be delivered? Beginning with that, then circling around it. And as you're creating your presentation, if things don't relate back to it, delete it. How many of us, when we're, we're getting ready to give a presentation, we have so much more that we want to say than we have time? I always do. I always have more slides than what I have time for. You know, that's being, over, that's being prepared. Then after you do your mind map of those free associations, onto the next page, I've given you a worksheet of how to organize it into an outline format. And the key tips that I want to share with you here is that your time-wise, your introduction is 10% of your presentation. Your conclusion is 10% of the presentation time-wise. And 80% is the body of the presentation. Now let me ask, how many of us have ever had this happen where you think you have 45 minutes on the agenda and then you realize that there's more announcements or whatever that could happen, and then it comes down to you have 12 minutes. How many of us have ever had that happen? Here's how you handle it, easily and professionally. See down under the body of the presentation, there's A, B, and C. C is nice to know information. You delete it. What happens if you have 10 more minutes deleted? You delete not need to know information, which is B. And then you only give them the A information with your main points. Bingo, that's it. And then you still bring it back to your closing of your presentation. So you go from your mind mapping to the outline. Then you add your dynamic opening and closing, which is the next page inside of your handout. And there are numerous options here. You bring it back together. And then you put it into your seven multiple intelligences your checklist of the seven with those ideas, which may have come up on your mind map. You bring them over. Now you have a complete presentation, and you begin with the end in mind and build backwards. Can I have a woohoo? <laughs> it's never been so easy to prepare a presentation. You need to bring to it. The larger the audience, the more you need to play with the audience because they'll give you energy back. Have fun with it. People want to be played with. They do. They just, it's like, make me laugh. <laughs> You know, let me have some fun with that. The larger the audience, the larger the graphics need to be. Often the larger the audience, the longer the laughs are. Hopefully you're getting them. And you need to pause for those and not step on the laughter because laughter is a connector. And the more serious your subject, the more you have got to sprinkle some humor in it. A couple of the other questions then. What about staying on point? Billboard, if you want to keep, make a couple of notes. So now that you've got the outline from your, on, a, on an index card, say 5 by 7 or 4 by 6, you would write three words, and it's 
one word on each line as if they are bullet points. Billboarding is a concept that comes from acting to help people remember their lines. You can now walk into a meeting with only billboard on your white screen in your mind and have just those three key points and you'll be able to stand up and deliver concisely. Index cards, the slides as a reminders. You know, you can use your slides to boost along or to have visual aids that people need to see. If, if you are giving whatever is on your slides to your audience as their handouts, they do not need to be present at the meeting. You can email them that. What you want the meeting to do is to engage. Engage, have conversation, brainstorm, work out issues, dialogue, come to decisions so that people have their input, then there's more accountability, responsibility, and ownership of that. So bringing that then. Appropriate use of humor, we heard a lot of it yesterday. The only inappropriate use is when you are poking fun at your audience and if anyone is hurt. So be careful with sarcasm. Do you have a question? Question on, on the slide you just had a minute ago. How much information on a PowerPoint? Oh, thank you. So he's asking how much information on a PowerPoint. There is a rule of thumb from Harvard as well as Wharton School in Pennsylvania that says it's a six by six rule. No more than six lines of type, top to bottom, and on each line, no more than six words per line. It's called the six by six rule. Today we've modified it to a five by seven. So no more than five lines of type no more than seven words per line. If you have more than that, break it up and cut down each individual thought and create them into their own slide. What people can't handle is overload. Break it down, keep it simple. That's a great question. So five by seven would be ideal. Graphics in the upper left hand corner is also the best thing to do. So have some fun with humor because as Dwight Eisenhower said it himself, a sense of humor is part of the art of leadership and getting along with people of getting things done. Humor brings people together. Find ways that you can do that because we need to laugh. We need to laugh a lot. How much do you think that the average three or four year old laughs today? Yeah, it, according to psychologists, I think who have no life, they counted 500 times a day that these four and five year olds would laugh. How much do you think that adults like you and I laugh in the course of a day? Yeah, not enough. Yeah. It's 10 to 12 times. What's really sad, it's not even a real life. It's a <laughs> good one, Chief. <laughs> Bring it out. So, what about lecterns? This is called a lectern, it is on a podium. It goes back to the Greek root of it, pod you stand on, lectern as in lecture, whenever you can get away from this. My style is heart to heart. I love to be on the floor. Even when I'm speaking to 5,000 people in the Salt Palace Arena following Thurl Bailey at a conference, I'm on the floor. Granted, he has two feet over me. I'm on the floor. I want to be with people. So this is the lectern. It has its proper place in formal meetings. That's what I'm going to say about that. Otherwise, it separates you from your audience. It has it, Robert's Rules of Order, Parliamentary Procedure. Yes, it needs to be led with this and with a gavel. We don't really do that in the county. The eighth floor may for their meetings. <laughs> so podiums, be careful about that. Risers, risers are typically podiums. Microphones, I am wearing a, a fairly invisible lavalier microphone, and it's fed through my sweater around to the back so that you are not seeing cords. If you, if you never, ever need to speak with one of these, be careful of the cord hanging out because you could grab it and it would make quite a scene and damage the equipment. You've got the best person back here, Tony, handling everything for you. And a slides, slides are to support your presentation, not be the presentation. And my tip here is what happens if technology fails you? What happens if? And she was masterful in how she handled that. Would you agree? So let's give it up for Linda. You got it. You got it. You need to be able to give your complete presentation without the slides. You never know when anything's going to happen. Today I brought three different backups for the system, plus all the cables that I needed, plus backups for those, plus a fat flash stick if we needed to switch from Mac over onto PC, plus two different remotes. Have backups to your backups. Because if something's going to happen, it will. <laughs> it will. Just be prepared for it. What about photos then? This is Spanky. Check out the heart on her neck from the San Diego Wild Animal Park. So what about photos then? Keep them large. Same thing with any of your graphics. 
the larger the audience, the larger the graphic needs to be, and on the upper left-hand side or left-hand side is going to be the best. Use graphics, have fun with transitions. This is a before from one of my clients, SDC Technologies in Irvine. And I said, just by tweaking that, it will be much more visible and professional for your audience to see. We also saw Yogi using great slides yesterday with his quotations right across it. So in, here's what happens. Subliminally, visually, it's anchored in our head about the Blue Angels. Then we capture the concept. Linguistics need to have the words on there. Visual, linguistic. Then he would also read it or allude to it. Often he paraphrased, which goes back to linguistic as well, yet creating a conversation and not reading the slide. So it was very brilliant in how he did that. Questions and answers? I think that the best time to handle these is how they flow in your presentation. If you can, during the presentation, when people are hot on that particular area before it moves on. How do you do this in your meeting? When you get to the end of that particular segment in the meeting, call for questions right there. Get someone timing it where you've got three minutes, you've got a timer, three minutes to handle Q&A at this time. At three minutes, bingo. A bell is sounded and you move on. It could be that after your entire presentation, then you can open up for more Q&A there too. Make sure to monitor your time though because what people don't like are presentations going over time. Now, what do you do to practice? The best answer to controlling any type of nervousness is preparation and rehearsal. One of the best places that I have practiced for the past 25 years is at Toastmasters. Raise your hand if you're a Toastmaster or ever been one, ever been a member, you got it, because this is a great place, it's a safe environment to practice your presentations.